So good afternoon, everybody, and um, welcome to um, this um, event as part of the Just Transition platform and the Coal Regions in Transition um, program of this week. This is a co-hosted um, event between Industrial Europe, um, the European Trade Union Federation for Manufacturing, Energy and Mining Workers across Europe and DG Energy. And in the spirit of co-hosting, you have uh, two chairs uh, for this afternoon's um, discussion, uh, myself, and I will pass straight over uh, to Adela to introduce herself from DG Energy. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. So not, my name is Adela Tesorova and I'm the head of unit for Just Transition in DGNR. Thanks, Adela. Um, so the objective of um, this afternoon's uh, discussion, maybe very shortly to introduce what we're, we're talking about, was to um, look at the dimension of the Green Deal and the energy transition and the impact in coal regions across Europe of um, that element in the just transition uh, principles of the ILO uh, adopted in uh, 2015, which talks about just transition being not just about anticipating change, but about creating new good jobs. And what we wanted uh, to look at together with DEG Energy was uh, the potential in um, regions across Europe, particularly coal regions across Europe, of the energy transition creating good jobs in the energy value chain and um, look at what's going on inside the energy equipment manufacturing sector and uh, the energy value chain across Europe. This is a real concern for our members, uh, trade unions across Europe and their members um, in the context of this transition. In many of our internal discussions, when we talk about just transition, the question comes up about do we have to wait? Will there be a gap? Um, as jobs are transformed and new jobs are created? Or do we get guarantees that new jobs are there before we are willing to transform uh, the jobs that people are in today? And this is one of the primary concerns that we hear um, from uh, the grassroots on a regular basis. So we wanted to look at this um, in more detail and to confront, um, if you like, the ambition of the Green Deal and some of the top level uh, job creation figures with some of the reality um, that we see across Europe. And so we've pulled together an interesting group of speakers who we hope uh, will do that. And we hope you'll be very active in the discussion as well. And you have as participants the opportunity uh, to ask questions, uh, to engage in the debate. Um, there is a Slido available. Um, you just have to scan this um, uh, whatever these things are called, uh, the QR um, uh, square, and um, and then uh, enter the code uh, CRIT2, and you'll be able to pose your question. And if it's a specific question for a specific speaker, please make that clear so it's easier for us. Um, and now I will hand over to my co-chair, Adela, um, who will um, give us um, an overview from uh, DG Energy's perspective uh, to set the scene before we then hear from our speakers from around Europe. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I have prepared two slides. Um, yes, um, so um, I wanted to um, just to introduce by saying that we believe that actually the the energy transition, the clean energy transition and the just transition actually go hand in hand. So basically the new jobs will be created at the same time as the old jobs um, uh, will gradually disappear. And um, maybe can I have next slide? Yes, uh, so here I wanted to show you um, what are the investment opportunities related to the uh, clean energy transition. Um, concretely, the 2030 energy and climate targets that we have, um, the, the revised ambition linked to, um, to clim uh, climate target plan that the Commission presented last year, so minus 55% energy saving, um, greenhouse gas savings. Um, and this means um, a lot of new investments, um, including in relation to energy. And uh, this new investment, can we go back? 
Yes, and these new investments will be in a number of energy sectors where they will be creating actually a lot of jobs. So as you can see from the chart, um, we are talking first about residential sector and basically building renovation. This is the, uh, the sector which needs the highest amount of investments over the current decade to, area, to arrive to the minus 55%. Uh, next to it, it's energy uh, efficiency measures in, in the small, small and medium companies in the tertiary sector. Um, An important one, of course, is also transport, um, but also uh, the power sector, uh, renewable energy, uh, upgrade of the energy grids, of the electricity grids, and also um, energy efficiency and green investments in industry. We expect uh, 350 billion above uh, uh, annually, what we have seen in the current decades needs to be invested in these sectors to achieve the minus 55% uh, climate target. Next slide, please. Um, and here to show you what is the growth uh, potential, uh, sorry, the job creation potential. Um, and as you can see, the sector which needs to receive most of the investments in the current decade uh, to, to reach our minus 55% greenhouse gas target is also uh, the sector that creates most jobs, which is uh, building efficiency, uh, mainly uh, jobs in the construction sector, but also in manufacturing of components for building renovation, of technologies for building renovation. So th you can see that the uh, just the transition and the green energy transition really go hand in hand, because uh, other sectors that stand out here in terms of job creation potential is uh, renewable energy, energy networks, including upgrade of the energy electricity grids, uh, but also transport and industry and all these sectors you have seen on the previous slide. Um, so this is just a short introduction. Um, and of course, I'm aware that um, at the level of the regions, the situation uh, you know, can differ. And we are, of course, here to discuss um, these more concrete cases. So this is just uh, to outline, the, I would say, the theory <laughs> and the models, what the models are telling us. And I will be very interested to hear the concrete real-life real cases. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, um, Adela, for that um, overview of, of um, where the uh, potential um, jobs uh, and where the ambition could lead uh, to, to job creation. Um, we're going to be uh, very much focused, I would say, on those um, the top lines uh, in blue and uh, the, the job um, opportunities um, in the energy sector. Um, and uh, to start us off, we have uh, two deeper dives, I would say. Um, it, although in uh, in a short presentation, it's very difficult to to give uh, all of the detail of what's going on in um, in our industries across Europe and in the energy sector across Europe. But to give us a kind of a deeper view, we have um, two speakers. Um, first of all, uh, and I apologise in advance for terrible pronunciation but I will do my very best. Um, first of all, we have uh, Janusz Jauwicki, um, which I hope I haven't massacred uh, your, your name, um, uh, who will, is the uh, CEO of the Polish Wind Energy Association and will be giving us um, a perspective of uh, that job creation potential um, in the wind uh, sector and its value chain um, and uh, and the very exciting plans uh, that have been laid out um, through the Polish wind strategy and how they will hopefully deliver um, good quality uh, jobs in Poland in this transition. So Janusz, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, ladies and uh, gentlemen. Good, uh, good afternoon. I'm pleased to give you this focus on uh, Polish case, uh, uh, giving uh, an outlook for the wind uh, power industry, how it affects uh, transformation, green transformation in, in Poland. I'm uh, really glad and uh, really grateful uh, since last few months uh, we are really uh, structuring uh, wind uh, power industry in Poland, uh, uh, having uh, uh, very positive effects and uh, very good statistics. 
I would like to share you, uh, share with all of you, and also give an outlook uh, from the perspective of the one side from the uh, government and also from the industry. Um, due to the fact uh, we have a different uh, point of view how the wind power industry can grow uh, in, in, in Poland, due to the fact we have the largest uh, wind power potential in the region. So uh, this is really significant how the wind, not only onshore wind, but also offshore wind in the next uh, years could grow uh, in Poland. And uh, I'm really pleased to uh, share this um, information with, uh, with you. Uh, first of all, few words, the next slide, if you uh, could switch, please. Uh, first of all, I would like to share information about the association. We are more than 100 uh, members domestically based and foreign in Poland, uh, almost two um, decades of experience for shaping the uh, regulation framework for the renewables in Poland. All the information uh, about the association and our members you can find at our um, uh, website at the uh, um, uh, there um, all the information you can find and in the next slide i would like to give the most uh, recent statistics about the uh, polish uh, wind industry uh, so today we are at the more than 6 gigawatts of uh, operating assets onshore wind and around four gigawatts under uh, cost construction. So altogether, uh, in the next two, three years, uh, we will have a, a number of 10 gigawatts uh, installed onshore wind uh, capacity due to the auctions that has been taken by Polish government and uh, energy regulatory office um, uh, last uh, started in 2018. After the uh, break from 2016, we are uh, coming back uh, to the uh, to the game and uh, getting new uh, green electricity to Polish um, uh, citizens. So uh, going further, we are looking uh, with hope on, uh, at the Baltic Sea, and we have um, more than eight gigawatts of localization permits. Uh, some of them are already uh, granted uh, by the Energy Regulatory Office with the state aid. Um, uh, see, um, soon it will uh, be, uh, um, the permissions will be asked for the European Commission for the uh, state aid uh, acceptance of this, uh, of this um, wind uh, parks. Uh, and hopefully the first park uh, will be completed in 2025, 26, and um, uh, the number uh, rising uh, eight to, uh, to nine gigawatts will be uh, completed until 2030, 2035, uh, due to our uh, schedules of the, uh, of the investors. So these are quite in enhanced projects. Uh, regulations have been established uh, this year for, uh, for development of offshore wind. So we are uh, we are on the good track. Uh, basically, we talk about the jobs. So uh, today, uh, in the industry, directly work from eight to ten uh, thousand uh, people, and another thirteen to seventeen thousand uh, working indirectly around the Polish sector. In more detail, uh, I will explain how the supply chain in Poland is created. Um, uh, so, since uh, I uh, since now I would like to move for the potential of the um, uh, of the onshore and offshore wind, and from the one side that I mentioned, we have the energy policy, the government plans, and you can see that the onshore wind um, is uh, planned for around uh, 10 gigawatts, what is uh, actually uh, corresponding to the number of uh, already auctioned uh, wind. We do not have um, regulations that will give another green field that we, what we are very much aiming to uh, open the full potential of onshore wind, giving uh, in our opinion for the in 10 years opportunity to have the accumulated uh, installed uh, power of 22 to 24 
to, of 20 to 24 gigawatts. This is what we can uh, achieve uh, in 2000, uh, 2030, 2040. It depends from the uh, analysis and uh, um, uh, calculations. Uh, reports are available on the uh, on the market, but this is the number we can easily go uh, around 10 gigawatts of new installed capacity since uh, next 10 next 10 years if we will prepare the if the government will prepare the uh, um, necessary um, regulation changes this means uh, around uh, 40000 jobs that could be uh, uh, that we can uh, uh, hire the industry uh, uh, indirect and direct working with the uh, with the uh, operation and maintenance as well as the supply chain uh, development uh, given to this uh, new capacity on the other hand we have the offshore uh, plans and strategies uh, of government rising uh, six gigawatts until 2030 these are these ready projects uh, acquiring the uh, state and uh, in perspective of 2040 um, uh, accumulating uh, strategies for 11 gigawatts again uh, we are much more uh, willing uh, to believe that this uh, industry can sharply rise according to the european uh, Union strategies uh, to, uh, of development of the industry and um, even even uh, targeting uh, 28 gigawatts uh, to uh, 2050 uh, and another uh, 34,000 uh, jobs uh, for uh, for the first 10 gigawatts of uh, delivered uh, installed capacity. The numbers are and uh, really uh, significant and um, also keeping uh, close uh, the uh, transformation aspects uh, to all the regions. Since the transformation is uh, happening uh, mostly on the south of Poland, nevertheless, you can see the potential of the onshore uh, wind where is basically uh, um, put uh, and localized uh, all over the Poland, not only on the north side, can deliver the right uh, uh, jobs to uh, ex uh, uh, miners uh, people working with the uh, uh, within the um, uh, power plants uh, on the south of Poland and uh, uh, easily can move to work for the onshore wind as well as uh, uh, for sure the companies uh, needed to uh, hire this 30000 people for the offshore wind uh, will um, uh, have the task to employ people all over the Poland to find the needed um, um, needed human resources to to deliver the offshore wind farm in the next five years. So next slide, please. As I mentioned in the beginning, the most crucial aspect for the moment for uh, full development of the uh, onshore wind is Poland. Is a distance act that had to be uh, changed uh, in Poland. Uh, there is a very good sign. Uh, government, um, uh, to be more more exact, Mr. Uh, uh, Vice Prime uh, uh, Minister uh, Jarosław Gowin delivered uh, such amendment to the uh, to the Council of Ministers, and we are waiting as a as an industry to proceed the the act and open the potential for the um, a green uh, investment in onshore uh, wind. Uh, we, we are really, uh, we are quite sure that after the proposed amendment, they are quite uh, good. We will be able to deliver shortly around five to six gigawatts of onshore wind in the next two, three years uh, to this uh, change. So the transformation for the green in Poland is really, uh, let, really close and uh, uh, wind power industry in Poland can uh, deliver a lot of uh, clean green uh, electricity with a, a low price. We have uh, amazing wind conditions, very stable conditions with the new machines on the territory of Poland. Uh, it's uh, really amazing uh, conditions uh, for the new for technology 
uh, wind uh, power. Okay, so uh, that's uh, that's uh, onshore wind, uh, and uh, we have the plan also to, if I can ask you to to uh, have a next slide to increase the development of the local uh, supply chains in in Poland. The supply chain in Poland is very developed, I would say, uh, compared to uh, other uh, European uh, countries, especially from the uh, from the region uh, here. Uh, I mean, here we have the full 100% 100% supply chain that could be del delivered to, on the uh, on the market. Uh, wind turbines manufacturers are producing here a all, all of the components needed to uh, operate wind farms. We have our own construction companies, uh, Polish companies, as well as for region, um, installing uh, onshore wind from many years back with the good knowledge. Uh, we have the production of the uh, um, uh, steel energy um, compo compo components like uh, the towers. Uh, uh, in our shipyards, we have uh, three large uh, producers uh, of it in Poland, as well as we have um, a few producers of blades. Uh, also, uh, uh, LM Wind with the largest available bla blades uh, onshore wind uh, in uh, in uh, in Europe. So uh, we uh, we have developed a, a quite well. Uh, operating uh, supply chain that could deliver much more for uh, next uh, uh, next uh, wind uh, investments that could happen and probably this uh, could be very much enhanced and uh, grow due to the uh, the act uh, regulations uh, that uh, I was uh, talking about before uh, to to amend then uh, probably more and more investors and uh, uh, plants owner will invest in a, in more advanced and larger uh, components to the uh, to the industry next slide please today uh, due to our study we made in 2019 uh, wind industry have the largest share of local content in the total uh, energy production cost by all technologies uh, taking in consideration uh, um, coal industry or uh, or the photovoltaics, onshore wind have the largest potential uh, for uh, for grow. And today it's around 50%. As you can see the blue chart, there is around 50% for today onshore wind. Uh, and with the uh, forecast for 65% even next uh, next years when we can deliver the new uh, new developments uh, in next next 10 years so uh, we are really glad to have this uh, industry uh, working uh, well and giving uh, giving jobs uh, offshore wind is giving uh, around 54% while with the perspective of 2040 but uh, for today uh, we estimate the local supply chain uh, for around 20 20% uh, so we can see how 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 uh, how we are how uh, we are now uh, producing for the onshore wind not only for Poland because this is basically most for the exports uh, needs and uh, uh, exporting the uh, technology outside um, outside Poland next slide please now I would like to talk about a few words about the plants about um, um, the plans for the transformation. Uh, we um, have been uh, discussing it today with, um, uh, with uh, let's say, a few months back with the Silesia decidents, um, possibility of opening the uh, training uh, center, uh, rescuing the, uh, rescuing the uh, people working with the coal industry, not only miners, but all the people working with the uh, with the sector and uh, reshaping them for the uh, needs of the wind power industry, but not only looking uh, more wider for the 
uh, renewable sector as well as the distribution sector that actually is also changing due to the transformation very much the energy distribution sector is very much also looking for the new skills of people working uh, uh, so far and uh, we are very much waiting with the project for the uh, for actually the funds for region in transitions uh, so the funds are really needed to to start the uh, the project we we have uh, ready um, uh, ideas ready structure and uh, can i go please further next slide uh, so uh, basically that this is a three steps uh, project uh, uh, the conference and training center is needed on the south of poland uh, when we professionally can retrain the employees to get a, uh, uh, get a job, qualified uh, person in the industry. Our uh, uh, members of the association today are willing to hire first number of such a retrained person. Uh, we are about to sign the agreement with the Polish um, uh, state asset minister. Uh, the first people getting out from the center will have a 100% uh, guarantee to get uh, a job. So this is what we are going to sign soon, I hope, with the, uh, with the government and deliver the jobs, not only off, uh, onshore wind, because some of the companies are also offering the jobs today outside Poland for the offshore wind for people who are uh, willing to uh, to 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 rest, uh, re retrain ourselves. Uh, we deliver very good program. Can I have a next slide, please? Together with the uh, Vulcan training uh, company that is uh, already operating on the north of Poland and uh, certif uh, that is um, uh, sending um, that is issuing the certificates. So can I have a next slide, please? Ah, this is the slide showing the possible potential of uh, localization of the uh, of the um, training center in Bytom in Silesia. Uh, this is what the uh, marshal and the president of Bytom would like to issue uh, such, a, such a center. And the next slide, please. And can you can you wrap up, Janusz? Yes, well, I'm, I'm just at the, at the end. So these are the uh, photos from the uh, center of training center that has been uh, re, uh, restructured in uh, Szczecin, north of Poland. So the same can happen to the old buildings in, in Silesia. Next slide, please. And this is how the center is uh, uh, training center looking today. Uh, the localization at the shipyard in uh, Szczecin. So the plan is very simple and we have the uh, human resources to run such a experienced um, uh, uh, trainers to run such a uh, trainings. Uh, what we are waiting today are, are the funds from coal region in transitions um, uh, uh, section. So thank you uh, very thank you. much. Thank you very much, uh, Janusz, for, for that overview. Um, of the of the potential and uh, the increased potential, um, depending on uh, political will and the policy framework, to go even further than the Polish uh, current energy plans and the uh, job potential of that. Uh, speaking as a trade unionist, obviously we're very interested in how we ensure the quality of those jobs and the industrial relations uh, surrounding those jobs, that they're organised and um, decent uh, in terms of working conditions. Um, but uh, it, I think that was a really fascinating overview of, of the uh, plan of tying up with the coal regions and ensuring uh, that those principles of just transition are implemented. Um, I'd like to now give the floor to uh, one of uh, my colleagues uh, from inside the trade union movement, uh, Gregory Pastor, who is the secretary of the um, European Works Council for General Electric Power. Um, and he will explain uh, how this uh, fits together, but uh, representing also uh, FTM CGT and a member of Industrial uh, Europe. So, uh, Gregory, uh, I pass the floor to you uh, to give us your perspective on, from the perspective of workers who are in today's um, energy equipment manufacturing sector. 
you have to unmute traditional online comment. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Hi, all. First of all, please excuse my English, and I know I've got a terrible French accent. I will try to do my, my best. Um, as Jude said, I'm the secretary of the European G Power Committee. It's almost uh, 10 countries, and uh, we work uh, mainly for energy. Uh, what G in Europe? G in Europe is uh, aviation, medical imaging and energy related equipment. 56,000 people work for it, of which in energy 30,000 people almost. And since the selling from Alstom, uh, suppression in Europe is presented to European country committee is, uh, so it's not complete. It's almost 11 uh, job cut. Jeep uh, represent 30% of the energy equipment manufacturer in Europe. Area of activity is very large. Uh, you have uh, energy conversion, chip propulsion, electrification, networks, wind power, biomass, clean combustion, coal, nuclear, steam, gas, hydraulic, power plant project, and the most important for GE, services to the installed base. So everything that is necessary for the transition to sovereignty on the controlled energy mix. But everything what I just described to you is wrong. The reality is that GE is soap. You can put anything in it as long as it spits out cash. The only things that comes for GE is short-term profit. The group made the fortune on a model of buying and selling activities, businesses, not on a real industrial development model. And this is why it's important to understand. This is why industrial groups see a restructuring plan as an investment where many see a loss of competence. In the relationship between United States and Europe, Britain recovery plan was immediate, while Europe is making recovery, recovery plans that are still being discussed. So for there, for the industrialist point of view, the United States and Asia are the decision-making powers that finance, and Europe is the market that discusses. It's why G in Europe does the minimum and services the market. Concerning China, for me, there is a paradox. Woolet, Alstom, ABB, Siemens, and all the other European energy players sell the industrial and technological flagship while allowing radicalizations to take place in the name of the great liberalism. If it's not Europe itself, because today I'm talking about G and financialization, but of but financialization is eating away at the industrial group. And without industry, you will we agree, Europe will not be able to envisage the Green Deal. Um, concern, um, by the way, uh, the restructuring plans carried uh, at the G, at G uh, shown us that um, when they relocalization, when they, when they relocated everything in India, in the same time, they cut everything in China. As to help the great ally of the America for the next year uh, is uh, India. Um, American policies uh, by American executive order also favor their own way for their protectionists, the repatriation of jobs to the US, since everything that is to be used for energy in the US must be produced in the US, but I know you, you know it. The R&D will be therefore be repatriated to the US, so you can imagine they will work for the transition in the US, but never forget the, the strategy in the US, it's CO2 capture, and in Europe we are on reduction emission. So it's different kind of application, so it will be again a proof, a proof of loss of sovereignty. And what's happened with the mask for COVID can happen with energy equipment tomorrow for Central. 
And for me, it's the most important, what we must keep in mind for the future. Um, during the last plan of restructuring in GE, we have uh, put in, um, in exert three things. Only the third one was a restructuring for load. The second one was job cut corresponded to global function in order to increase the margin. And the last one, it's relocalization mainly from Europe to India to increase margin also, but only for one person. Imagine 2000 jobs in one restructuring, one third is only 1% of the margin. So we can't say it's the market with a cutting job. The problem is really uh, a choice dedicated by finance. So for me, we are in a paradox. I heard a lot of things about clean combustion, biomass uh, during the Europe, for, for the European Green Deal. But the reality is uh, uh, this uh, industrial sector are uh, being abandoned because uh, they are not profitable enough in, uh, in a short term. ABB, Siemens make the same choice. It's not just the case of, uh, of G. Um, and um, they, they, they have a lot of activity in, uh, in energy. Uh, but uh, I, will, I, will, I would like to take one example for you. Uh, about what uh, Judith spoke uh, just before uh, in the capacity of transform uh, employment. Uh, I, will, I will take uh, the French example. Uh, we created, we will create job in the Cherbourg in wind, and at the same time in the gas in Belfort, we are cutting job. But there is no, insensi no incentives uh, to uh, shift the job losses from Belfort to move it to, uh, to Cherbourg. Remember, the only things important is short term cash profit. What this mean? It's making total brutal uh, movement from one energy to another. If this is the contrary of the transition that Europe needs. For uh, the moving from load from uh, the west from Europe to the east from Europe, I would like to give you the answer from my Hungarian colleagues. They have conscience they are just one step in the moving on, on, uh, of load. When G will be able to find cheaper in another place, they will move again, okay? They are conscious they come in Hungary because the wages is very low. So they have conscience they will not be able in the future to increase their, their wages because if they want to keep the load, if they don't have low wages, G will not stay. And this is the first revendication for them. And you know better than me, where the wages are very go down, the ecology goes down in the same time. Okay? So to conclude, I would like I would like to say some things very quickly. Whatever type of energy Europe will be moving towards tomorrow, it cannot do without a strong industry. An industry that serves the population and provides access to decarbonized energy. That is an act accessible as possible. Not forgetting his social role in restructuring the economy. Otherwise, Europe will be destroyed for the benefit of the United States or Asia. So in conclusion, I will give you five points. Quickly. For me, that this is it's urgent to have an industrial policy that aims to invest in Europe for the return of investment in Europe. Encore strategic industries, giving Europeans the means to consume in Europe by putting by barriers to goods coming from companies that we allocate for profitability alone. Promote a familiar industry with a significant 
count share of investment in growth. And the last one is all of this with the aim of protecting the current situation. Otherwise, we will not be able to turn back and it will be the big groups in the names of the big capital we, that will make the choice of tomorrow energy instead of the citizens. And never forget, services is the most important for big companies because they are margin at 70%. Jude, I give you back the voice. Thank Let's you very me. much. Thank you very much, Gregory. And thank you for uh, making a really clear um, argument for why it's so important that um, we have a joined up policy uh, framework tying up also with um, the upcoming industrial policy strategy at European level, uh, that our energy policies, industrial policies and the just transition have to be a policy jigsaw in some ways to ensure that um, uh, our ambitions are able to be uh, delivered on the ground. This is for us, uh, the energy equipment manufacturing sector is a really uh, strategic sector in Europe and the enormous restructurings which are going on at the moment mean a fundamental loss of skills to the European economy um, and a loss of uh, knowledge and know-how to which we will be dependent on importing um, back in unless we defend uh, these interests in Europe through a strong industrial policy. So thank you very much for giving that example of what's going on in General Electric. Um, I realise we stole a little bit of your time, Adela, uh, but uh, I think uh, we have one fewer speaker than we foresaw, so uh, we're, we're still quite flexible. Um, so now I will hand over to you and let you chair the second half of the event. Thank you. Thank you very much, Judith, and, and thank you to, to your speakers for the excellent presentations. So now we are moving uh, to the panel, uh, which um, is a bit smaller than we foresee. For, uh, for, uh, we have foreseen. So we have now two speakers and I have some questions for them and then we will move to a Q&A session where all our speakers will um, can receive your questions. So we also encourage you to uh, to go to Slido and ask questions. So our uh, our next um, uh, two speakers and our panelists um, are um, um, Michal Hetmanski, uh, who is uh, president of the Instrat Foundation and will present the case of a ZEPAC in the Konin region in Poland. And then uh, we have uh, Miguel Munoz Rodriguez, who is the head of climate policies um, and alliances at Iberdrola. Uh, so Michal, can you, um, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Adela, and thank you, Judith. I hope I can start sharing my screen. Please hold on for a while. I think you should see it now. Is it OK? I don't see you. Yes, so yes okay, please see that. Great. Thank you very much. I will try to be brief and, uh, and stay within three to four minutes to present you our uh, research that we have done on the region of Eastern Wielkopolska. Uh, part of Wielkopolska region in Poland, which is one of the six, seven coal regions in Poland. And uh, as you might have observed, uh, Poland is definitely uh, is, is definitely dominating the discussion about just transition in in Europe and beyond. But it does not mean that uh, that all coal regions in Poland are still sticking to coal, since we have this one uh, one example and one exception from the rule that one region in coal in one coal region in Poland has a commitment to phase out coal. I would like you to uh, to present um, a part of our research done during two uh, during three reports that we have produced. We have established together with WWF Poland on the OIKI project that you have uh, been uh, observing uh, numerous times during the coal regions in transition platform. Is a, this is the main report and two complementary publications that showcase our methodology and approach towards forecasting how will the closure of lignite like industry in the eastern greater Poland affect both the labor market and the energy mix uh, and electricity generation in the long term, uh, thanks to our uh, modeling done by our um, modeling team. Uh, I would like to briefly showcase you what, what uh, where Eastern Wielkopolska is. I, I know that already today Mr. Maciej Sitek from the regional authority had a chance to, to present the region. Unfortunately, I was not available at that moment, so sorry if I repeat uh, several facts that you have might observed. 
Eastern, Eastern Wielkopolska, Eastern Greater Poland is the only coal region in Poland that has a clear commitment to phase out coal. And fortunately, this, uh, this declaration by the regional authority and by the utility ZEPAC is the only one that is, uh, that is first clear and second com uh, compatible with Paris Agreement. That is, uh, that is the company who wants to halve the current coal capacity by 2025 and close the last power plant and uh, open pit mine uh, with uh, brown coal lignite extraction by 2030 the latest whereas already now half year after the declaration we see that the process might get even faster so we can phase out coal in eastern Wielkopolska in five and not ten years uh, because of this brief declaration the region has also been selected by the european commission to be supported under the just transition mechanism fund there are also uh, several other regions for mostly upper silesia that also uh, competes for the funding and other regions, but uh, but the chance to get to acquire the funding from the just transition fund is not that certain for other co regions. So this is definitely one of the flagship cases from Poland, and I would even say just transition um, just transition uh, sandboxes, if we, if we could say so, about uh, phasing out coal. The regional authorities have also um, uh, announced a declaration to achieve climate neutrality by 2040 that is one decade earlier than the entire eu so this is also a kind of an answer of the regional authority to be aligned with the climate goals of the european union compared to the uh, climate policy of the regional of the national government that assumes to burn coal and extract until even 2049 and not achieve climate neutrality on the national level uh, Zepak is a, is a company, is a, is a lightnet complex that has uh, been active in the region already since 1945. So we have a huge, uh, so we have a long history of coal uh, that has been shaping the region, uh, whereas only the last decade uh, has been marked by already closure of one power, of one big power plant complex and one coal mine. And we could call it to some extent also a successful transition, since in the region, uh, in the western part of the eastern Wielkop in the eastern part of eastern Wielkopolska, that is here in the Turek region, where the power plant and the mine have been closed, uh, we did not observe a substantial increase of unemployment, though even the unemployment rate remains on, this, on the same level as before. So we could say that the closure of, 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 of coal sector does not necessarily uh, had, had to lead to the, uh, to, the to, the, to the contraction of the um, outlook on the labor market. The, um, the reorientation of the company uh, has been signaled one year, uh, half a year ago in October 2020, where the ZEPAC announced that it was going to replace the current lignite uh, generation and capacity with renewables also dominated in the region but it is still not sure whether the miners and power plant workers will find their green jobs in the new green business in the hydrogen onshore and pv economy there is no clear answer to this but we try to provide a framework to assess this potential uh, as i have signaled the uh, uh, the unemployment rate in Eastern Wielkopolska is uh, is substantial in terms of uh, compared to the to the whole region and to Poland, since it is two times high the unemployment rate. But we see substantial disparities within the region uh, that do not allow us to make a clear assessment whether the region has been a, a successful or unsuccessful case of transition during the last decade. We have done an assessment on the individual employee level data on ZEPAC and we forecast that by 2030 uh, as much as 55% of the employees of the group will acquire retirement rights. That means that, by, that uh, the remaining 45% might uh, require support from the active labor market policy if we are going to phase out coal by 2030. Uh, the problem of uh, spatial concentration of uh, and social challenges um, in the in the region of Zepak is uh, is also focused to, um, for mostly five communes, where in the in the biggest five communes there is Minas, approximately two thirds of the old employees of the Zepak group are living. At the end of our my presentation, I will try to show you our estimates for the 
uh, job creation potential thanks to the investments in renewables um, that are um, th that bring prospects to replace the current number of jobs in the region uh, that is now dominated by coal that could be uh, replaced by renewables. So within the last decade, the, the, the employment has decreased from uh, almost 9,000 workers uh, to, all, to less than 4,000 workers. So this means that annually, this is approximately 520 persons leaving the company annually uh, in the massive layoff process that has been happening over, over the last decade. But this process has been split between two parts of the regions, that, it, that is the konyin Pontnov region and the turek Adamov region. Um, in our um, in our uh, modeling and uh, and research, we anticipate the commissioning schedule that has been announced by ZEPAC, that is closure by 2025 and 30. We assume this as a reference scenario, but thanks, but due to the higher CO2 price uh, that we see already happening now, we anticipate a, something what we call alternative scenario, where all coal activity would be closed by 20. 24, eventually one year later, 25. This would mean that uh, additional 700 people would need, would require support over the next five years if we are to phase out coal and, uh, and uh, close all power plants uh, within less than half of the decade instead of a uh, decade. The, the, in the alternative scenario, we forecast that this acceleration would be as much as 30% compared to the to the current path of labor force reduction or to the reference scenario that is the announced ZEPAC strategy. Um, a very important matter uh, in, uh, in making a forecast and, uh, and, uh, and, and, um, and considering the transition scenarios in the, in the region is also the number of indirect jobs. Due to some historical events, the vertical integration of the value chain uh, in the lightnet economy is very strong in Poland, in particular in ZEPAC. So we don't observe a huge number of indirect jobs uh, around the ZEPAC company. Most of the jobs are already uh, located within the company, which creates also a challenge to orient, reorientate only the company and not only its suppliers that could have uh, another market to be concentrated on. When it comes to alternatives to coal, we use our. Uh, we would like to show uh, how, in, how over the uh, ten next next ten years, the investments in renewables, that is onshore and P and photovoltaic installations, lead to uh, lead to changes in electricity mean in electricity mix, but also on the labor market. As a, um, we would like to show you how the current uh, pilot project that has already been established last year, that is construction of a 70 megawatt photovoltaic farm that is constructed that is constructed in Brzev, very close to the former lignite uh, mine, is employing only less than 10% of the labor force from the current or previously uh, reduced uh, employment from the ZEPA company. That means that we need a um, uh, we need a strong policy intervention to make to reorientate the company's value chain from servicing current power plants to to go into the renewables business. Since this process is not that uh, is not that obvious and it does not happen from uh, overnight, as it has already been said today. In our energy and input output modeling, we we have decided to re, to adapt the uh, to adapt the framework and methodology uh, showed by the Joint Research Center in the studies uh, showing the renewables potential in the Espresso model, but also in the coal regions in transition um, studies from uh, from Kapataki et al. from 2020. And we adapt the methodology to show that up to two, two and a half gigawatt of renewable potential in onshore alone could be established in Eastern Wielkopolska. Uh, in our modeling, we show that uh, that less than 500 megawatts uh, could be established in uh, by 2025 and 940 megawatts by 2030. Um, as the benchmark for this, we showed that ZEPAC uh, alone intends to build a similar uh, level of uh, onshore and PV installations by 2030. So we, so this is uh, also, this proves that our methodology is more or less in line of what the already market is is showing. On the chart to the right, you can see how we uh, how we forecast the 
um, the allocation of uh, of, tur of wind turbines in the region based on the uh, based on the land availability from our model. When it comes to employment potential, during uh, thanks to our framework uh, and the input output modeling, we uh, we conclude that up to two times more uh, jobs could be created in the alternative scenario where we try to replace. Coal, uh, replace uh, coal with renewables faster compared to the reference scenario. We can create up to two times two times more jobs in the in the um, uh, energy sector only in direct and indirect jobs. It is, however, hard to estimate how in this particular region the share of direct jobs could be located in the region. So this is uh, also a challenge from the research perspective. That requires a further definition of how the renewable value chain, renewable energy value chain, is, make, is also benefiting the, the regional economy. However, in the short term, we calculate that the earlier closure means a decrease in tax income for local communities, which are already now benefiting from the uh, from the vast uh, from the very generous payments from the ZEPAC company, but in the long term. It generates more value added and more uh, tax income for the local economy. Uh, we define that the, that, the, um, that the current business model uh, of the lignite economy, that is mostly ZEPAC, needs a strong uh, needs a strong intervention to reorientate the, the the current business model of the company into the renewables, since the company has all has always been neglecting the new potential in in the clean energy economy. Um, and it requires strong intervention, also fueled by the uh, by the reforms and investments from the Just Transition Fund and the mechanism. I would like to also point out to one very important Could aspect. Could yes. Could you please wrap it up? Thank you. <laughs> yes, thank you. One very important aspect that we focus only on energy sector jobs and not only and not on the whole economy. So uh, as much stressed today during the during the meeting. Economic diversification is also much needed in the economy. One slide from uh, my presentation is that I would like to invite you to uh, to take a look on our Energy Instrat PL um, platform, which is a ma power market call and climate data hub for Poland, where you can find more information about uh, about the energy and coal sector in Poland and uh, also our further studies. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michal, for this very interesting presentation. And now I'm uh, passing the floor uh, to Miguel. Thank you. To speak about Iberdrola experience. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me to this interesting uh, panel. I think uh, the sound is not uh, is sufficiently up. Can you hear me the now? Volume. The volume. Yes, okay, exactly. I will increase the volume a bit. Thank you very much for inviting me to this interesting uh, panel. I will provide the experience of a global company, a global utility company that is present in more than 30 countries, supplying energy to more than 100 million uh, people. More of our capacity, more than 72% of our capacity is based on renewables. So uh, I will focus at the beginning on huge remarks on, on the engagement of Iberdrola with the just transition and maybe I will take some lessons from our particular experiences in some particular regions of Europe, especially in Spain, taking into account the Spanish context is the one that I know most. Uh, for Iberdrola, the energy transition is a huge opportunity to invest, to create prosperity, jobs, focusing specifically in the investment in renewables, storage, smart networks, etc. But of course, we see this as an opportunity, but we are fully aware that in the short term, this transition could have a negative impact on those regions that traditionally had focus or had industries in the fossil fuel uh, area. No? Indeed, um, in, that, in that context, Iberdola in the last 20 years have focused in parallel in closing all the coal and fossil fuel facilities, uh, 8,000 megawatts in, in total. But at the same time, the company has invested more than 120 billion euros in the last 20 years in renewables, smart grids and storage. We have in parallel developed these two processes. Of course, as I have 
told you, taking into account the global perspective, but focusing also in those communities that had particular problems on this issue. In the Spanish case, in this particular uh, context, it has been particularly useful the just transition strategy launched by the Spanish government two years ago. It provided a very interesting tool, the framework agreements. Taking into account these agreements, the company worked along with local communities, companies, customers, uh, NGOs, labor organizations, etc. We worked together in those regions where we had those facilities to provide solutions to invest in renewables, to develop innovative uh, solutions, some uh, contact with local suppliers, to award purchases, etc. Uh, coming back again to the global perspective, Iberdrola will accelerate its investments in renewables, networks, smart grids, uh, recharging facilities for electric vehicles in the 2025 horizon. We will invest in the 2025 horizon more than 75 billion euros, doubling our uh, rest capacity by 2025, uh, improving our investments in energy efficiency in networks. Taking into account the particular context of the 2020 year, it was a huge crisis, of course, as you know, by the pandemic, etc. We focused in our investments in REST, but also in our contact with suppliers, awarding purchases in that year for more than 40, 14 billion euros, supporting more than 400,000 suppliers. In that year, in 2020, we hired 4,000 people, almost 2,000 of these people were under 30. So we were working with our communities, with our suppliers across of our whole value chain, of course, focusing on the clean solutions, but working locally with our communities in conversations to provide solutions to the transition. Not only with our investments and our plans, we are working on this field. We think that it's also important to advocate in the global conversations, in the at COPs, at global summits. That's the reason why in 2019, in the climate summit organized by the Secretary General, we were one of the first company to sign to join the Just Transition and Decent Jobs Pledge. We think this pledge, of course, was focused on encouraging all the companies to follow in ILO core standards, not only in their own chains, but also in the uh, contractors and the suppliers. It was a very, very important uh, pledge and it was a very interesting job internally to work with our different departments, to analyze it and also to try it was also uh, to try to explain to our colleagues from other companies uh, this pledge because as my my position uh, names i work in climate change and alliances we think it's very important to be all on board when we are talking about just transition and that's the reason why these kind of pledges are very important taking into account the spanish context we have been very active in uh, in two particular uh, coal plants in Belilla and also in Lada, in Asturias. And under a general point of view, it has been very important in this particular context, the investment in renewables that we have committed in, the, in these particular regions. We have been working with a very innovative organization, Climate Kick. I'm sure that most of you know it, with Climate Kick to, to try to work on innovative solutions, social solutions to this context. We have been in conversation with local suppliers. In the case of Belija, for example, we have purchased contracts, uh, contracts to more than 700 suppliers in the region. In the case of Lada, we have been working with the shipyards uh, with Windar to provide uh, some contacts also. So the conversation is complex, I must recognize. But in the case of the Spanish context, we, we have a very interesting tool, very important tool, the, the framework agreements. Uh, and we have used all the potential of this tool to, to have a fruitful conversation with our main stakeholders in the, in the regions. And under a general perspective, I think these are my key remarks. Of course, I'm open to the conversation in the Q&A session. Thank you very much. Um, we have still some time left, so I would encourage um, participants to this session to um, to introduce their questions in Slido 
so that we can open uh, the Q&A session very soon. But before we do that, I would like to ask um, a question to each of the panelists and maybe I see Judith. She might also have some questions to the panelists, so uh, we can maybe have one question each. Um, so we start with the two panelists who came later. Yeah, and then we open uh, the floor for everybody. Um, so maybe starting with Michal. Uh, thank you very much for this very interesting presentation. I mean, it's really impressive that a company who basically has a business in coal mining and um, a coal based uh, power production decides to go out of business and restructure completely to change. And so quickly, I mean, this um, so. Um, um, but I was wondering, I mean, there, but there must be a strategy. I mean, the company cannot just decide um, to, to close down everything they have been doing in the next five years without having a strategy how to reskill their workers and what to um, what to invest in. So, I mean, you outlined it a bit, but could you go a bit, maybe a bit more in detail about the strategy of this company, how to completely change the business model? Thank you. Yes, thank you very much for this question. Of course, I am not a representative of the company and I need to admit that uh, before 2020, we have seen only the worst practices of how this company behaved uh, regarding environmental and social aspects. But fortunately, there has been some shift uh, in this and uh, the, the ghost of just transition has finally went into the company. So there are so I think that uh, that we observe some 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 positive shift, at least in the say last half or one year. Uh, but it's not uh, that easy to to change the structure of the whole economy in the region and of one utility within less than a half year. So I think it's a good progress also showing that when you're private, it's uh, maybe also the the path of transition is somewhat faster than compared to state-owned utilities, which are dominating the Polish uh, coal and energy landscape. Um, of, when it comes to reskilling of workers, there have been projects uh, also submitted to the to the regional authorities how to uh, how to um, facilitate this transition on the labor market. But there is, of course, no guarantee. These, these are nice words and assumptions from the research perspective. I need to admit, oh, we'll make miners work in renewables. But when it comes to like you know competitive market process. Yeah. The same company that is employing former miners is not that competitive when it comes to installing the same PV installations. So you can also see it in the in the last board uh, in the last letter of the management board to the shareholders. The, on, in the pilot in the pilot project that the company has been boasting and yelling about, only le, only around 15 workers have been in, uh, employed in the construction of the photovoltaic farm compared to some 150 to 200 workers, uh, mostly migrants from, from Eastern Europe, that have been working on the same installation. So you could say that only the local, the local workers were only a small portion of the labor force employed in this pilot project. So, but I think that uh, it requires first intervention from the Just Transition Fund and mechanism to make this kind of process of reskilling and reorientation of businesses and workers towards the new economy, it requires first intervention through investments, but also through reforms, because we should treat workers in the economies, uh, in the economies and sectors undergoing the such a structural transition, additional support. And such projects have been fired and uh, supported uh, by the company and by, by the labor unions. If we have, if you have a chance, I, I strongly encourage you to take a look on the letter that has been jointly sent by the labor unions from the Zepa Group and the, and also co-signed uh, by the management board to the commissioner Franz Timmermans, where the unions advocate that they need to prepare for this faster transition that I have been telling about in five, not ten years. But they need money that would guarantee that these workers that are now employed and have, of course, higher wages than in the usual value chain of renewables, that these people find their jobs. And it's not that easy and it's, um, beyond the research perspective, it's rather the case of political economy, how you make sure that this money lands in the pocket not only of overall um, renewable based companies, but of those companies and those employers who will employ these people. That uh, that might suffer from this transition. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, very interesting. I was just wondering, maybe Janusz from the Polish Association knows something about the project happening uh, with the Zepak company because, in a way, they will be interested in wind energy as well, right? And they might be interested in the reskilling program. Of course. Uh, 
For, for today, ZEPAC is not very uh, active uh, concerning the wind, in, uh, wind industry, so I'm not uh, very much close into the, uh, to, into the projects uh, that are in self um, prepared uh, in the Wielkopolska. We are very much uh, focused at the moment at the Silesia and uh, the, the, the largest region of uh, coal uh, in Poland. And uh, uh, hopefully uh, the, 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 there is a huge uh, willingness of the decedents out there to, for, uh, for changes. Uh, believe me, my heart is rising when they are uh, talking about the transformation and they understand it have to have to happen and soon and uh, also they have uh, plans uh, project and uh, waiting forward for the uh, for the funds i see that thank you very much and uh, maybe if i may i ask uh, another question to miguel and then i'll uh, i'll pass the floor to judith um so you spoke very much about um first the national framework and then the work that ibedrola has done with the local partners uh, with the with the NGOs, uh, with them, I mean, uh, with other associations and the regional bodies um, in the most problematic areas. Could you maybe uh, explain a bit more um, or give us maybe some concrete examples um, how this has been done? Thank you. Yes, for example, in the case of uh, Belilla's plan, this in this in a particular uh, region with special problems in terms of demographic in Castilla Leon, it's called in Spanish, and there uh, there is a, a problem because there are low employment opportunities. There are the the age of the population is quite high. There are particular problems in that field. So when Belilla plan uh, to face to the phase out was launched. Uh, a huge investment was planned on a, uh, on the biggest solar photovoltaic plant in the region, 400 megawatts, uh, prepared to be uh, installed there. The investment pipeline in renewables, in wind, especially in that region also was increased. Investment in the smart grids in the region were increased, providing to local suppliers some uh, support with some purchases awarding. Also, we were in contact, as I told you, with um, with Climate Kick to create a local platform to promote entrepreneurship. It is very important. I think it's very especially important to to set some kind of uh, bodies or platform to encourage uh, entrepreneurship. Some local businesses to create some kind of opportunities at local level. It is a long term, of course, issue is very difficult in the short term to create the, this kind of ecosystem. But in parallel to those investments in renewables, in training, it's important to work on the on these issues. In the case of Elia, this was one of the main action streams in the framework agreement. Of course, in this framework agreement, we're uh, deeply involved in the local administration, the unions, the general administration, the Ministry of Ener uh, Ecological Transition, and we were working with other stakeholders uh, locally, with, uh, with some NGOs, uh, with some par different parts of our businesses, we as a direction of climate change were also w w was also involved. So it is a, a challenging process, of course. It uh, takes a lot of conversations until the final draft of the agreement is concluded. But it, of course, it uh, it's a very positive outcome, and it's now it. It is a good experience for us to, to work on this. This is the case of Elilla in Lada's plan uh, in Asturias. Uh, we had a quite similar situation under an, econ uh, an economic perspective, uh, low population, uh, higher uh, unemployment rate, etc. And we focus also in these uh, triple aspects, no? Uh, res investments, local engagement with suppliers. In this case, we had a huge contact with the shipyard uh, Windar to, to work on different uh, supplies. And also we work to, to create a local platform, a platform to promote entrepreneurship. Here in this in this field, we focus on actions in the in the field of circular economy and waste recovery. 
since we understood that in that area there were some kind of opportunities on this field. It's important to make a good, a good assessment on field, on the field, taking into account, of course, the perspective of these different stakeholders that I have mentioned before. Very good. Thank you very much. So um, up to you, Judith. Yeah, thanks very much, um, Adela. Um, I have a, a few a few questions uh, from my side as well. Um, maybe starting uh, with uh, Gregory. Um, we heard from uh, the case of Janusz uh, presented uh, from the case of Poland, and um, we also heard from Miguel um, it, the uh, role that uh, local content um, can play in terms of ensuring local jobs. Um, in the energy sector and um, it would be interesting uh, to have your view uh, Gregory on what the role could be in terms of um, European action around in, within industrial policies uh, towards the energy industry uh, to ensure that we guarantee that supply chain uh, within Europe. Um, we're talking about specific regions here, but also uh, within within Europe as a whole. Um, that would be really interesting uh, to hear a little bit more from you, Gregory. And then maybe I, I come to um, a number of the other speakers as well. OK, um, I will try to, to make a short answer, but a complete answer. Uh, what, what you need to understand is uh, the industrial energy branch is totally different uh, one country to another country, okay? Um, and the relation between uh, of, uh, each kind of energy is different from one country to another country. So it's, it's uh, quite difficult to, to say uh, you have the same problem everywhere. OK, it's not a secret. France is based on nuclear mainly. Uh, uh, Poland was coal during long time. They try to move. England uh, it's, is more a mix like for like for France. But what is sure, Europe needs to move to uh, a better uh, energy mix. OK, and what I tried to explain just before, um, you, you need to move some job to another energy, OK? If the Green Deal said we need to have less nuclear, more wind, more hydraulic, uh, I don't know, more solar, uh, more uh, everything, we need to prepare the moving from the job from an energy to another energy because it's not the same knowledge, it's not the same skills, it's not the same lot of things, OK? On the problem we have today to prepare all country to have worker for, for the transition, it's to, to have some protection to be sure company, I say GE, uh, ABB, Siemens, for example, um, don't use the leak of protectionists in Europe for their own interest, so I said, and I will explain, they, they use the leak to move from an energy brutally to another. Example, you say, I don't want any more nuclear. I need to reduce it. I cut job, but I don't, try, I don't use this time to have a transition to win. You lose all the, all the skills. This is what's happened today. On the... And what is important to, to understand, it's more the Europe will be social, more the interest on the protection for our energy transition will be increased. Finish. Thanks very much, Gregory. I think it's really refreshing in a, um, a panel like this. Sometimes we only uh, look at the beautiful pearls um, in the in the jewelry box uh, in Europe, and we only look at uh, some of the the good examples. And uh, we can see uh, some good examples. And I think it's also really important um, that um, we 
reflect on uh, some of the areas where it's not working uh, well, because uh, the concerns of workers um, that we hear inside the trade union movement um, around transition, there are those who are um, uh, have the experience and uh, the relations with companies where there is a plan, there is a strategy, there is engagement, dialogue. We heard very clearly from Miguel how Iberdrola in Spain has um, really used and um, and fed, I would say, not just uh, benefited from, but also contributed to the uh, framework of negotiated just transition planning um, in Spain. Um, and then we have uh, examples where that's absent um, and uh, and workers talk to workers across different companies, see the different experiences and that can um, increase the anxiety about uh, the transition um, that we're underway. So I'm really interested, maybe a question to you, Miguel. You mentioned uh, the commitment that Iberdrola made um, at international level. Um, you're one of the, the companies that have stepped out, stepped up, I guess, at international level to commit to uh, just transition and decent work. And so it would be interesting to hear how, uh, not just how you implement that um, in your own activities, but also how you are mobilizing within um, your community of employers and multinational companies to convince others that this is the right way to go, um, that we have more good examples of um, negotiated just transition within companies and that actually uh, some of the leading companies take um, take the initiative to do that work. So you mentioned it in passing, but actually it'd be really interesting to hear a little bit more about um, that work that you're doing. doing and, um, and if there's a little bit of positive competition, we hear that uh, Orsted, for example, have negotiated um, agreements uh, with unions uh, to ensure, uh, outside Denmark in their case, to ensure uh, good jobs good working conditions in their new licensing sites. Um, are Iberdrola doing the same kind of thing um, in all of the sites that they work in? Thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your question. It's, it's very interesting for me to answer it because I was really involved not only in the in the signing process of the pledge, but also in the implementation and also in the engagement with communities. Uh, of course, I will start by explaining more or less the internal process, and after that, I will I will explain more or less our engagement uh, externally. Internally, it was challenging, of course, because I remember that uh, the B team group was very involved now at the beginning, now in the in the drafting, and they contacted us, and I had to explain internally to all the stakeholders, different departments, the purchase director, all, and. I am focused on climate, but not all the people are so involved in this kind of conversations. So first uh, first of all, I had to explain it internally to different stakeholders from businesses, regulation departments, purchases departments, CSR departments. I uh, created a small group to explain it and to work on the implementation of, of this. This was the first step. Uh, once we agreed to sign it, and, and we committed, we continue this conversation, internal conversation is ongoing, of course, uh, so far. And this is the internal process, challenging but possible. After that, uh, we try to, we are a part of the of one interesting organization, the Spanish Green Growth Group. It gathers a huge important group of companies in Spain. Most of the huge companies are within this group, a, a lot of small companies. And this is a very progressive group in terms of green growth. We want to promote, to make advocacy, to encourage green policies, a, a positive narrative on green growth and jobs. This group is focused on this. And Iberdrola is vice president of this group of companies. And we, in fact, I coordinate the climate policy group within this group and I took I used this platform we used this platform to explain the pledge to encourage them to join the pledge a lot of companies join this pledge 
of course, I, I have for, I have forgotten, but it's, they were one of the most important part of this internal group. We had unions on board also internally. We explained the pledge to them. Most of them know it, of course, but we were we had this conversation with this multi-stakeholder approach. And externally, we work, for example, in this group, but I also work in a Europe, in, in at European level. We are part of the uh, corporate leaders group. They are also very supportive to climate policies and climate ambition. And we were working also in this group to, to have on board not only the usual suspects on these kind of conversations. For me, in some way, I had the advantage that I work and I represent Iberdrola in a lot of alliances. Uh, the problem is that these alliances were focused on climate policy, and in some way, these pledges were beyond no, this aspect. We had to engage people from different uh, areas, and it was challenging, but we did our best, at least, we tried. And it was a very interesting how a climate summit, the Secretary General Climate Summit, was a good opportunity to work on ILO standards to promote decent uh, conditions across the value chains in this transition. For me, it was it was one of the most interesting campaigns in this uh, summit, 2019 summit, one of the last summits in person, <laughs> unfortunately. So thanks very much. Um, yeah, it, it's. I think it's it's really interesting to to kind of hear your experience as a company of of companies driving uh, the decent work and just transition agenda. We hear very much the um, the the union side of uh, the action, and it's really great to hear the company advocate uh, advocates um, explain how they're how they're rolling out. I wondered for the um, for the Polish uh, colleagues whether I could pick up one of these questions, Adela, which have come through from the audience. Um, I, I originally I come from a coal field region from the northeast of England. Um, I know very much uh, what uh, a, a, a bad uh, transition means in terms of um, the social impacts, the very long term uh, social impacts. Um, of uh, of bad transition, um, and there's a question here from Romania, uh, which um, is specifically on uh, the the issue of um, depopulation and how you ensure uh, that job opportunities uh, are available um, in a context of depopulation, which is something which affects many of the the coal field areas. Um, and how to, um, I mean, I'm, I'm reading between the lines of the question. I can read the question, but I, I'm kind of reading between the lines of it that um, how we, uh, how on the one hand, uh, we ensure that the job opportunities are in the coal field regions. Um, on the other hand, how we deal with the fact that people might need to move uh, to where the new opportunities are and questions of um, relocation. And this is something which is also a very challenging debate in the trade union movement when we talk about how to deliver just transition territorially um, in different parts of Europe. So I wonder if there are some perspectives on that from um, Michael or from Janusz, um, how, we, how we avoid depopulation um, and all the negative things that that brings with it, um, how we ensure the, the job creation actually in the coal field regions. Mm. So if may I answer uh, some of this question, I can see it's very challenging, of course, uh, the question of uh, reallocation of uh, people, especially in the context of uh, offshore development in uh, Poland. So this is a completely new uh, story we, uh, we are beginning and uh, a lot of uh, human resources is uh, needed to uh, uh, develop the, uh, the process. 
and uh, of course we uh, we have to face this uh, this problem the good point is that uh, a lot of people in poland are working today at the onshore wind business is quite uh, happy about the uh, the, the job uh, industry is offering to people so there is a widespread information around the poland that working for the wind business is a good deal so uh, actually a lot of people are uh, going around and asking companies service companies installation companies is there any new positions available they would like to do a test and actually the certification uh, is the quite a barrier to entry the market by employment so every fourth of the service uh, providers on the windmills, it comes from Poland. I don't know if you are aware of this, uh, but uh, it's a very popular job. And we believe if we can go with the offer to the coal industry in Poland and show how much you can earn uh, and what is uh, the job all about, this is much more safe than going uh, down uh, for two kilometers uh, above the, uh, under the ground. Uh, and uh, stay safe with the industry. How are the statistics? Yes, showing onshore wind is uh, one of the most uh, safe uh, uh, industry uh, today. And uh, giving all to this uh, people, we believe we have a great offer. And uh, we start the discussion with the people working before for uh, Tauron or PGE as a, uh, as a um, uh, people working at some maintenance in the coal power plants or the uh, all to wind uh, uh, water power plants uh, to their they are transfer in the group within the group to the parts of the Poland and uh, these are great people I know uh, some of them and they are really enjoying working for the wind business today in north of Poland for the PGE utility so we can uh, we can observe it but by case and we are um, really uh, experienced how the people are are moving uh, in Poland of course this is not on the large scale uh, today we need uh, around 50,000 of new employees uh, if we can deliver the uh, the potential of uh, Polish wind onshore and offshore so uh, for sure it's a huge uh, and challenging task but we have to provide a good training uh, from the just transition uh, funds to, to these people and to find a new uh, potential. And this is also the role for the Polish government to show that there is a potential, growth potential. One of the huge aspects now we are working with the Polish government is the sector deal uh, for the wind development. This is very engaged process already we've been working since half of year together with the ministry and climate and other uh, and other um, uh, ministries in the uh, um, departments in the polish government uh, Cl minister of climate is a uh, is a head of it and um, and uh, is running the the process and the commitment between the industry and the government uh, now becoming to shape the what would be the future directions and what we are waiting for is the potential uh, the steady growth of the market for the next uh, decades uh, for the renewables and uh, uh, from uh, from the pers perspective of the investors the polish government is looking forward for the jobs and looking forward for the impact of the local supply chain and this is what is on the table today then uh, as investors we will have the easy process going with the grid issues it's everywhere the case so uh, this we would like to ensure in this sector deal and uh, make the process going smoothly together with transformation. This is uh, a really optimistic looking for the transformation, uh, transformation, giving a good background, like this kind of uh, agreements we are uh, working uh, with, uh, with the government as an as a industry. This is good experience we got from the Great Britain, actually. Um, that's, that's great that you um, have, have uh... Um, had a, a good a good impact from uh, the British. I know that uh, there are uh, strong dialogues uh, between uh, the the um, the British um, wind energy uh, sector and the Polish um, wind energy sector um, going on. So uh, that's that's good to hear about. Maybe I don't know if Michael also would like to come back in on this point. Yes. Yeah. 
Yes, so uh, I would like to draw your attention also to one um, significant disparity between hard coal and lignite regions. Since lignite regions are uh, up to up until today mostly dominated by the kind of agricultural and industrial profile. They have not went through the third phase of uh, uh, of economic development, they did not go into services. For instance, then in Upper Silesia and Great and Western Małopolska, you still have a quite vibrant sector of uh, of uh, of other industries, and of course the services sector, which creates alternatives for the for, for the hard coal and energy industry, which means that the mobility between the regions or the threat to uh, or the threat of the population is not that strong for hard coal regions. So we speak rather within Upper Silesia of internal mobility within the voivodeship within the region. So it's a matter of commuting to job half an hour one hour or how much yes this is also a um, this is also part of the research already done in poland by by different institutions whereas when we speak of lignite regions like eastern wielkopolska we rather speak of a long distance mobility and sometimes also a threat of moving threat or a challenge or a, or a chance to move out of the region but this concerns two groups first the like the, the miners and power plant workers that potentially need to reallocate in the long run to find their job in other industry or in other uh, region. In case of, for instance, Eastern Greater Poland, it's usually Poznań, the capital of uh, of the voivodeship, which is only located one hour away by train or by car. So it's not a big threat. Poznań you know, is enjoying one of the lowest unemployment rates all over Poland. So in theory, you can grab the chance that is le that is very close. But this means that the favor the population of the Konin region might happen. For instance, in 1945, when uh, when the lignite complex has been established in uh, in Eastern Wielkopolska, the city of Konin was 10 to 12,000 uh, citizens large, whereas until 2010 it grew 10 time, uh, it grew up to a size of 10 times higher population. But within the last 20 years, it uh, decreased by 10%. So we have a strong depopulation process. The young people migrate to large cities and do not find attractive, um, attractive uh, alternative for them within the city. So we should speak of rather treating two different groups. Those who will migrate anyway, and those who can be commuters or eventually have to increase their mo preference for mobility to stay active on the labor market. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Michael. Um, in fact, whoever our colleague is from who's asking for tips for Romania has added a little bit of uh, an extra dimension to the, the question in the Slido um, and specified that if there are good examples or best practice of how to use local fiscal in incentives or instruments to attract investors. Um, and I wanted to also get your view on this question of depopulation, how we draw investment in to create jobs locally, uh, Miguel, um, since uh, you're, you have actively, and as you set out in the Iberdrola strategy, really gone to the areas which are um, most affected by the energy transition. Um, are there uh, tips from Spain in terms of the policy framework of how to ensure that regeneration locally, uh, which are, are particularly useful potentially for other, other member states, for other regions? Thank you for, for the question. First of all, I think the first thing is to, to recognize the problem. In, in that way, in Spain, the Ministry of Ecological Transition is also uh, has also under uh, its competencies all the depopulation strategies. So these two things are connected in some way. In this field, in the case of Spain, the the strategy, the just transition strategy, when it was drafted, it included within the framework uh, the particular importance of those regions and to take into account all the, the population and aging aspects within these agreements. So the framework for the conversation, at least, is was set, taking into account the problem. And yes, uh, it is a challenging issue because sometimes at a local level you have to to study very well the characteristics of the of the community that you have in place 
Sometimes you can use renewables to harness uh, jobs, to harness uh, the energy of the of the region. But sometimes you, you have to take into account if there are some uh, communication strengths that can be used no, to provide uh, solutions or to provide um, employment across the region. For me, it's very important to start by developing a very robust assessment on the characteristics of the region and to start framing the solutions and the conversation in base to this uh, assessment. Thanks very much. And I think um, that's a, a really good point on which to wrap up um, our session. Um, from my uh, side, I, I think um, it's been a really interesting afternoon hearing um, the the different uh, interventions um, and the, the challenges which are faced by this transition about how to ensure that we really are able to create good quality, decent jobs, um, real true uh, just fair and just transitions for the workers affected by the energy transition. Learning from uh, the bad examples as well as um, advocating and promoting good practice um, examples and ensuring um, from our perspective the importance of um, worker participation, social dialogue and trade union involvement um, in just transition uh, strategies within companies, within regions um, and at national level. And I hand back to Adela maybe to, for a few words to, to conclude as well. Thank you very much, Judith, and many thanks to our panelists and speakers. Um, for me, this was a super interesting session. Um, and maybe since we haven't answered one of the questions, now maybe I use my wrapping up time to ask uh, all of you um, about the, the last pending question, which is about um, um, old generation of wind turbines. And um, but I, to be honest, I don't understand the question. How this will be addressed concerning material mixes? Is this about recycling or this is about the future types of wind turbines? So maybe Janos or one of you would, would understand the question and would be able to answer it still in the remaining two, three minutes. Otherwise, so I, I understand yeah. that, that, that the question concerning is uh, repowering in uh, Germany. So for sure, uh, as an industry, we have to take responsibility of the uh, of the uh, uh, of the, 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 the insufficient uh, materials that are uh, from the wind uh, turbines and to address this issue. And there is a lot of uh, um, pilot uh, program concerning the uh, carbon print of the uh, wind turbines. So uh, I believe that this issue will be addressed soon. And uh, for instance, the, the blade issues, uh, great project uh, that has been just uh, recently uh, published from Japan, uh, stating that uh, the blades could be a part of the fundamentals for the uh, um, fast uh, railways uh, uh, to establish the uh, necessary um, uh, 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 elastic foundations for the such a high speed trains. So uh, this uh, everything is uh, uh, happening at the uh, at the moment. So. The standardization issue is uh, quite important to have the same um, the same projects uh, with the uh, replacement of the old uh, uh, wind turbines for the for the new one uh, uh, with the respect of the whole Europe is uh, uh, very needed and uh, wind Europe as far as I know uh, they are working hard on this uh, issue of standardization of this um, aspects. So, um, many thanks to Judith for, for the co-chairing of the session today and many thanks to everybody who was with us this afternoon and, um, yeah, and um, goodbye. <laughs> bye bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.